Well, thanks, Maddie. It's an absolute fantastic pleasure to be here. Um, and thanks for asking me to speak on this topic as well. And I apologise, there is a little bit of repetition in this from previous speakers, your talk being one of them, and the speakers to come. But I think that does us some value in reinforcing the most salient points around CTO crossing. So I'm going to focus very much on femoral poplar teal CTOs. Uh, Dr. Aid is following me and he's going to focus on tibials. These are my disclosures here. So these are my uh, five personal tenets of CTO crossing. You have to start off by planning your approach. You have to know your equipment really well and you have to have it all in the lab at the beginning of the case. You need to consider what bailout maneuvers that you might require and prepare accordingly. I have a low threshold for considering general anesthesia, particularly when I know a case is going to be tough. Not only does that reduce contrast related to patient movement, but it makes it more comfortable for your patients. And I think you have to give yourself plenty of time. These are long cases, and if you rush them, you will not have time to get a satisfactory result. So this is a femoropopatil CTO, um, just to familiarise you with it. The proximal cap, which is often thick and difficult to penetrate with conventional guide wires. This is often the reason why we end up in a subintimal plane. There's the cal calcified atheroma, which is also an impediment to guide wire passage. And there's the distal cap, which is often much thinner and can be taken advantage of from our retrograde wire crossing techniques. There are also microchannels, which you can't see on your angiogram, of course, but you can see on histology. And the operator can take advantage of these by engaging them with a guide wire and using them to at least start in a transluminal crossing plane. So the way we do that is we make um, a nice little curved angle, a 30 degree angle on the tip of our guide wire, and then we really drill through the atheromatous plaque. This is the way we make the angle. You can see it's about 30 degrees. The angle starts about one to two millimetres back from the tip of the guide wire, and it's usually just done on the finger using a, a wire to help with the shaping process. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to equipment. Uh, Mehdi's asked me to talk about guide wires, and I could give a, a, an hour lecture on the engineering of guide wires. It's such a complex and important process, but look, just to give you a very short description, it's all about the core diameter and the core material. So the vast majority of these are made of stainless steel. Um, the core diameter is usually either 035, 018, or 014. Um, the, the tip itself is very important. So this, in an engineering sense, is about the relationship between the grind and the taper. The taper is where it tapers down, the grind is the straight portion, and this gives the tip its characteristics, which we're all familiar with. The, co the coils are what coat the outer lining of the tip, and they can either be bare coils or they can be coated in a, in a polymer jacket. And these are um, what give it the lubricity and or the tactile feedback that we experience from the guide wire when we're using it. And the grind and taper are what determine the actual weight of the guide wire tip. So there are thousands of these guide wires and it's really beyond the scope of this talk to go into the individual detail. But just suffice to say that the individual important parameters of a guide wire are threefold. The tip stiffness, so how much weight it takes to deform the tip. The tip diameter, which in turn leads to the penetration power. So this is a metric that's defined by the previous two and this determines how much penetration you can get through a cap. I think of them in terms of workhorse wires first and foremost, and when you're talking about femoropopateal crossing, I'm usually using 018 inch guide wires, um, and my favorites are the Command 18 and the V18 control, but occasionally we might use a stiff angle, uh, a stiff straight or angled glide wire by Terumo. I very rarely use 014 guide wires in the femoropopateal segment. You then have CTO specific guide wires, and there are a, range of, there are a variety of CTO specific guide wires. HT Connect 250T is an interesting one, and we have a, a family of win wires for the 014 segment. Um, and then you have special use wires, which you pull out for a particular purpose. And this is how I think of them workhorse, CTO, and special use. We need to also be familiarised with uh, our crossing catheters. So these are the, a couple that I use frequently, the Quick Cross from Spectronetics and the CXI from Cook. These give support to our guide wire tip, which is of utmost importance when crossing. You need to think about the balloon you use. So you may think balloons are all the same, but in fact, if you look at them under magnification, the crossing profile and the tapering of the tip are very different. And we need, when we're treating CTOs, to have something that's able to cross and follow our guide wire. I'm going to talk now about standard and some uh, less common access approaches. So the most common approach, as I understand it, the United States is a contralateral up and over approach. Um, I use this rarely. I use it really only for the obese patient, someone with common femoral disease or iliac disease that I'm going to treat on the way through, or with a very short common femoral artery and a flush SFA occlusion. For everything else, pretty much, I'm doing an ipsilateral anti-grade approach. And I'd have to say uh, this has several advantages. 
Um, it's faster. It gives improved pushability and enables us to use shorter devices. But it's essentially, if you're going to treat tibial CTOs, it's very difficult to get any pushability down around the level of the ankle if you're coming up and over at length. Um, it's very important to get a good ultrasound image because you need to make a high common femoral artery puncture, particularly if you have proximal common uh, SFA disease. But most of the time that can be achieved, in, in my experience, maybe 80 to 90% of the time. And then you can place a short sheath in the common femoral artery, and that really sets you up for the rest of the procedure. Of course, if you fail from antegrade, the next step in my practice is a retrograde access approach, and there are a variety of different ways you can skin this cap. Um, if you're treating SFA disease, uh, I think it should always be used in conjunction with an antigrade access. So it's not retrograde access on its own, but in conjunction with antigrade. The patient can be positioned supine, as Mehdi showed us, with the hip externally rotated and the knee flexed. That's that frog leg position. Um, it's a medial approach. I use roadmap and or fluoroscopy for this, but you can use ultrasound. There's no reason you can't. In fact, the SFA is very easy to see on ultrasound. And what you do appreciate with ultrasound is the position of the vein as well. So if you're treating proximal SFA disease, you can use an above knee popliteal approach. That's perfectly valid. However, if your disease extends more distally, you might have to go below knee pop. But the principle here is you need to get as close to that occlusion as possible whilst giving you a small amount of working room so that you can manipulate guide wires and catheters. So it's either above knee pop or below knee pop in this sort of scenario. But of course, if you're talking about popliteal disease per se, you really need to be looking at a retrograde tibial puncture. I'll talk about that in a moment. Once you have access from the popliteal artery, then it's easy to place a forefront sheath, and then you do the guide wire passage from retrograde, which is always surprising how easy that is and re-entry is compared to an antigrade approach. You then externalize the wire. You usually feed that into an angled catheter from above. You can use snares, but they're mostly unnecessary. And once you have that through and through wire, you're in an excellent position to push and pull. So even the tougher CTO, you can be pushing from above whilst pulling the wire from below, and you'll get there 99 times out of 100. You then do your pre-dilatation, and you end up doing your treatment with DCB or stent, whatever is your preferred modality of treatment, but that's the end of that case. Um, and then simple pressure is usually enough at that point to seal the distal puncture site. So if you're doing a tibial puncture, um, you need to be familiarised with the C-arm positions. So for an anterior tibial or dorsalis pedis puncture, you want a completely AP plane. If you're doing a perineal, I like to angle a little bit to the contralateral side, really to take the fibula bone out of the equation, because it is easy to hit that if you're in a purely AP plane. In a posterior tibial puncture, you want to do a completely lateral approach. So that's usually about 45 degrees, depending on the way the patient's leg rolls at the hip. This is a proximal AT puncture, so I usually use a roadmap to initially puncture the skin with the needle and make the fir first few centimetres of advancement, but then I move to live fluoroscopy with injections of about five to seven mils of contrast, so you can see the blood vessel in real time and you can detect if it's moving because it's calcified under the tip of the needle. Uh, this is a case that I did with a colleague of mine at um, the Verve Symposium, which we run in Sydney in December. This was a perineal puncture, so I've done this from below and he's above. We've seen the flashback, and as often happens with perineal, because it's so deep, it's common to go through the back end of the blood vessel, so that's what we've done here. And you can see what we're doing is inching the microcatheter needle back and then advancing as we go to find uh, the correct plane. So we've done that initially in an AP plane, and then we've switched to a complete oblique plane. So if you're dealing with popliteal disease, it's important to have a long sheath down to the level of the popliteal artery, so you've got maximum support. Um, that's usually a 45 centimeter sheath. Oh, I've gone black. You, you went over the time. Oh. Shall I go to conclusion, or will I not come you back You can up? just say, it. No, you won't be able to go back. <laughs> I can't go back, so I will just conclude. My apologies for going a little bit over. You're serious about time around here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, I have a lot more to go. There we go, conclusion. So I think it's important when you're treating CTOs to have a good knowledge of your equipment, including your guide wires and your crossing catheters. You've got to always plan your approach. It's important to pre-plan, so prep the legs so you can do all those retrograde access points without having to mess around too much. And you should consider an early transition to retrograde wire tracking. It saves time, I think, as Maddie has showed us in his earlier talk. Thank you for your attention.